Bonjour, good morning, dobre utra, konnichiwa. Ready to start the second day of uh, AC30. Uh, following the very successful first day, uh, we enjoyed a very good uh, discussion about uh, how the solar powered okay. airplane flies <laughs> and the temperature très belle, fluctuation très belle over four years. Avec and, uh, comment le, le véhicule solaire marchait bien. Comment les Today we switched gear. Uh, we talk about the latest and greatest achievement in the human space program, which is happening today up on orbit. And uh, this is called the latest uh, breaking news from space. And uh, this session is co-chaired by, by me, uh, Soichi Noguchi, and also uh, Alexander Pavlovich, uh, my uh, co-chair. So we'll be uh, chairing the morning session. Part one is mainly US, Japan, France, Part two is uh, uh, Alexander Pavlovich will take care of the second portion. And uh, uh, just a few reminder, uh, administrative reminder from the uh, committee. First of all, all the speakers, please speak slowly, like I do right now, to catch up with the translator. And the second, uh, if you are watching through the web, uh, webcast, uh, you can uh, send us all the questions through with the hashtag, hashmark A3. AC30. And uh, if you are not watching through the website, uh, uh, you can uh, watch it through the uh, www.ac2017.fr. Okay, uh, we're going to ready to start the second day. And uh, this technical session starts with the traditional uh, post-flight report. And this is a chance to hear the, the recent flyers to come up to the podium to share their great experience. Obviously, yesterday we hear uh, from Thomas Pesquet. Uh, we have him come up to podium 20 times last year, last day, so uh, he's already tired. But we have a secret weapon from the United States, uh, Dr. Kate Rubins, and also another secret agent man from JAXA, Takuya Onishi. They spent about four months last year on orbit, and actually they sent us uh, the video greeting to our Congress in Vienna. And uh, they are very happy to uh, come up to the podium to share their experience uh, of their expedition 48 and 49. Uh, without further ado, uh, Sasha, do you have anything to say? No? Я думаю, что все ты хорошо сказал, и мы сейчас предоставим слово Андрею Борисенко, который недавно вернулся из космоса, и будет доклад построен так. Он расскажет вам сначала о том, какие у него впечатления остались об этой миссии, и второе, он вам покажет, нам всем напомнит, что же это в качестве представление видеоматериала, что происходило во время экспедиции. Хорошо. Начнем? Everything was, was said. So, uh, we will start Thank the session. So, uh, Dr. Rubens and Mr. On va commencer la session. Et on vous attend sur le podium. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Takuya Onishi from uh, JAXA, and she's Kate Rubins from NASA. So I'm going to talk very slowly. That, that is not because uh, I'm not a native speaker. That is uh, because they asked me to do so. <laughs> so uh, we are relatively new members of the as uh, Association of Space Explor Explorers uh, because uh, we just uh, flew to space and uh, came back on Earth uh, last year. And uh, today uh, we are gonna make a short uh, post-flight report of the International Space Station Expedition 48 and 49. And before we jump in uh, our post-flight video, we would like to uh, introduce all crew members of ISS Expedition 48 and 49. So Expedition 48 started on July 7th of 2016 and ended on September 7th. Uh, Anatoly Ivanishin was the commander of uh, our Soyuz vehicle. That was the first vehicle of uh, Soyuz MS series. 
and the Expedition 48 was led by the commander Jeff Williams and also Oleg Skripochka and Alexei Obchinin. They were waiting for us on board the station. So I believe Jeff and Oleg were are here. So can you guys stand up? Hi. And Expedition 49 uh, started on September 7th and ended on October 30th. So for this one, uh, Shane Kimbrough and Sergei Rizhikov and uh, Andrei Varyshenko, they joined us for the Expedition 49. And I believe uh, Andrei should be here. Can you stand up? Привет. <laughs> Okay, so, so now I'm gonna start our post-mission uh, video for you guys. So we spent almost two years in the uh, star city of Russia and uh, our, we were launched from a uh, Baikonur cosmodrome, uh, cosmodrome. And our, our launch was on uh, July 7th that was a very uh, clear, sunny day. And here comes the Soyuz internal video. And you'll see a shock that was caused by the sudden loss of acceleration. So this is the moment of uh, the separation from the Soyuz rocket. And of course, we are very happy uh, to make to make the space flight. And usually, it takes only six hours to get to the station. But uh, since uh, our vehicle was the first Soyuz, after some modifications have been made to the from the previous model, uh, we spent two days to get to the station. Actually, that was very good. Uh, that gave us time. Uh, to get used to the microgravity environment uh, before we jumped into the huge volume of the International Space Station. I was really impressed uh, when I saw the station first time from uh, the small, tiny window of the Soyuz vehicle by the fact that uh, human beings uh, built such an enormous, huge laboratory in space. So we were docked with the station uh, on the s July 9th, and uh, three crew members were waiting for us. So we first uh, came through the hatch, and for Tok and I, we had trained for many years, but this was our first flight, and we trained entirely in mock-ups in, in Moscow, in, in scuba in the US, and we'd never seen the real space station. And so it's an incredible feeling, first of all, to be walk, not walking through a mock-up and having to duck through the hatchways, but actually being able to float, um, but also to see uh, the smiling faces of our crewmates who had launched several months before us and we hadn't seen in quite some time. And so we started very quickly on an incredibly busy uh, scientific program. And you can see Jeff and Oleg here working on the SPHERES experiment. So this is a long time uh, running NASA experiment that recently has started to have uh, international participation and uh, can, can collect schools around the globe uh, where students actually send up programs to maneuver these small satellites. Uh, another part of our research program was some of the fundamental molecular and cellular biology. So one of the very first experiments I started doing was an experiment to look at cardiomyocytes. So the cultured them, we grew them in cell culture in space for 30 days, and then returned them on a SpaceX vehicle. We also got the chance to perform the first DNA sequencing in space. And this was uh, incredibly exciting. I'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon. Uh, but you can see here, these are the very first results of the first DNA sequencing on board the space station. And this is made possible by some very miniaturized technology. So we're starting to change the way we do laboratory science on board the space station uh, by using these, these smaller technologies and analyzing data in real time. We also have a fluid shifts experiment, which is a, an excellent experiment with joint 
uh, U.S. and Russian participation as well as IPs. And uh, we're using the, the Chibis lower body negative pressure here to study effects of the, the fluid shifts on orbit. And so we can do things like ultrasound, uh, OCT of the eyeball, and look at this both in normal space station environment as well as when we apply lower body negative pressure. So here I was assembling the uh, US private company's external uh, experiment platform. That was very cool that uh, uh, I was actually uh, doing the final portion of assembly of uh, space experiment device. And I used the Japanese module airlock to transfer the platform to outer space. The uniqueness of this airlock is uh, we can uh, transfer anything that can fit in this volume uh, to outer space without doing any spacewalk. And uh, this is a different example, but uh, with the combination of uh, the airlock and the Japanese robot arm, uh, we can actually deploy small satellites uh, from the ISS. The good thing is uh, those satellites are packed in a cargo vehicle within uh, packing materials. So the structural requirement is much uh, less uh, than uh, compared to the regular satellites. And those satellites are this big and they are also uh, very capable. And we saw some uh, visiting vehicles. I think uh, this one is uh, SpaceX 9. Dragon uh, cargo vehicle. It was always fun uh, to see a new vehicle coming to the station because uh, it carried not only a, a very important experiment but also some bonus food for us, like uh, fresh food. Fresh fruit. One of the best uh, things that the SpaceX Nine carried was actually the international docking adapter. Um, so that meant that uh, Jeff and I got a chance to go do an EVA and install this docking adapter. Uh, so after many hours of suit prep in the airlock, uh, Talk uh, is the most amazing IV and got us uh, all buttoned up and ready to go. And uh, we came out the hatch. This was my first spacewalk. Uh, I was really excited uh, to do this with Jeff, who's an incredibly uh, experienced spacewalker. And uh, together we worked on installing the international docking adapter, hooking up all the cabling, uh, getting the power ready, uh, and, and getting this docking adapter uh, bolted to the very front of space station, which is an amazing place to, to do a spacewalk uh, at, at the very front of space station as you're flying. You're right in the, the front of the, of the vector, and you can actually um, get some incredible views about that for a week or so. And then we said, you know what? We can take all his cameras, label off, and we had a lot of cameras on space station for a while. And uh, uh, we were glad when he got there, but it allowed us the chance to uh, set up cameras to do things like uh, capture these incredible Earth imagery, as well as night photography. Okay, and uh, it's time to say farewell to the Soyuz 46. As crew, so Jeff and uh, Oleg and Alexei were leaving the station, uh, and uh, our commander uh, Anatoly Ivanishin became uh, the Expedition 49 commander. So this is uh, seen from a change of command ceremony, and there was a hatch closing. Look at his happy face. <laughs> <laughs> But we were so sad to seeing uh, them off, uh, leaving us on board the station. Because they taught us many things. We felt like uh, how we are going to work after tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and going back to the Earth is always it's a kind of adventure. Uh, this is a separation burn from uh, the station, and you'll see this kind of orange plasma uh, surrounding your capsule during re-entry. And finally, parachute opens, then uh, they made safe landing. 
So we watched this all on board from Space Station. Uh, NASA was able to stream up the NASA TV coverage to us, and so we could sit in Node 1 and uh, watch the crewmates undock and safely land. And uh, we stayed up until we saw their smiling faces in Kazakhstan, and we knew that everybody was out of the vehicle uh, and that they were safe, and they were excited to be home and seeing their families soon. And science continues. So one of the things uh, that we were looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is uh, what are the ways that we can really transform the space station into a full-up molecular biology laboratory? Uh, one of the things, the techniques that we use there is pipetting, and we need to be able to centrifuge samples. Uh, some of the guys were very inventive at NASA and decided to 3D print a centrifuge rotor, which we could then put on a drill uh, and actually use that to centrifuge our samples. And this device is called the uh, ELF, uh, Electrostatic Levitation Furnace. So instead of building a furnace with a thick steel wall, uh, we use electrostatic force to levitate a small piece of sample and uh, to control its position and use a laser uh, to heat it up like uh, up to 3000 degrees Celsius to uh, measure how a material uh, behaves at such high temperature uh, like uh, viscosity, surface tension and so on. And we can use uh, the data to develop uh, high efficient uh, turbine engines on the ground. I really enjoyed uh, to take part in uh, educational PR events. So this is a scene from one uh, uh, educational event. I was just uh, pedaling my foot without holding anything. And uh, this one is uh, uh, trying to mix two liquid balls in microgravity. The white one is uh, milk and the brown one is coffee. So this is an experiment to make a cafe au lait in space. That was actually very hard to handle those liquid balls, but finally I made it. I think uh, it was probably the most expensive cafe au lait in our history. So I couldn't help tasting it. but the taste wasn't as good as uh, the one uh, you guys have on the ground. And we had the arrival of uh, OF-5, and I did the capture for this uh, cargo vehicle. It was a very shiny, uh, beautiful cargo vehicle with tons of uh, new supply, uh, supplies. And one of the best things about uh, this vehicle is that it's essentially adding an entire new module to the space station. So we had, we had tons of supplies uh, and equipment available. And the next crew arrived to the station, Shane and uh, Andre and Sergey. Uh, they came up on the Soyuz. So this is a picture of three vehicles simultaneously at the same time docked with the station. We were very excited to see them. We were so happy. We even gave Shane his cameras back. <laughs> yeah, as soon as we welcomed uh, them, uh, then uh, it was time to say goodbye to them because uh, they all, their launch was delayed, as Kate mentioned before, for about a month or so. So we spent only 10 days together on board the station and uh, it was time to say goodbye. So Shane took over the command of the station.
And it's always bittersweet saying goodbye to your crewmates and knowing that it's time to, uh, to get ready to get into the Soyuz. I think the morning of our undocking, I was still doing a few experiments and spending a little bit of time in the cupola taking some last photos. Uh, and then it was time to, uh, to get into the vehicle and to separate from ISS. It does give you that beautiful view of space station once again as you're leaving. Uh, and you can really look back and see how enormous space station is, how many modules we've added to it, uh, how beautiful the solar arrays are and uh, just this amazing experience in, in something that's an engineering marvel that humans have built. Again, so this was a re-entry, and this was the parachute opening. This is a video from the fixed camera, so you can imagine how violently the capsule was vibrating. And soon you'll see our seed are going to be raised up uh, in order to absorb the shock from the landing in case uh, landing thruster didn't work correctly. <coughs> and here comes uh, the moment what is called soft landing. <laughs> and you can see smile on my face because uh, that was far from soft <laughs> landing. <laughs> it's a good feeling when you're still alive after all of that. Yeah. <laughs> And it was really wonderful for the first time to open the hatch when we were back on, on the planet and uh, feel uh, the atmosphere and feel some fresh air for the first time. It was a beautiful day in Kazakhstan. Uh, we had a little light breeze. Uh, and just to, uh, to see our, our friends who are in the SAR forces, uh, to see people again, uh, and to know that we were going to be well taken care of. And uh, we had many, many exciting things to tell people about when we got back about living and working on the space station. One thing I was really surprised is, uh, I th so I talked to Japanese media at the landing site, and then I thought that was a little bit difficult to just talk. And I came up with the idea of that, uh, uh, maybe I forgot the weight of my tongue, so that was because uh, uh, I felt difficulty to just talk. Did you feel the same thing? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to talk to any, any media. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to rest for a little while. <laughs> okay, so that's it uh, from our post-mission video. And using the rest of our time, uh, each of us like to uh, talk about one aspect of the International Space Station program. And uh, I'm going to talk about... Uh, ISS as uh, one of the best models of international cooperation. As you know, International Space Station program is a huge scientific uh, international program uh, in which as many as uh, 15 countries uh, participate in. Uh, but not only that 15 country, but also there are many countries uh, involved in this program. So let me uh, introduce one example. So JAXA uh, uh, has been conducting one program which is called Kibo ABC. It's a collaborative program which aims to promote ISS Kibo utilization in the Asia Pacific region and to share and build on the outcomes of Kibo utilization. Uh, we do many things. And uh, this is one example. Uh, the event is called uh, Tri-Zero-G. I did this event while I was on board the station. It's an ed educational international event to motivate uh, young kids to study about space and uh, become interested in space. And uh, usually, uh, JAXA astronauts go to space. Uh, we do, we perform. Uh, basic scientific experiments that were proposed by Asian students. So I'm going to show another video from that event. Kibo represents the hopes of many human beings. An effort are underway to 
pass that hope on to the next generation. Asian Tri Zero G is a competition where young people dreaming of careers in astronautics can submit their ideas for experiments to conduct on Kibo. The relevant organization in each country plays an important role in the selection of the successful experiments. The selected experiments are then actually conducted by astronauts aboard the ISS. This competition has been held six times. In 2016, five ideas were chosen from 120 submissions. On September 14th, Takuya Onishi carried them out on the ISS. The young people who proposed the experiments watched them being carried out. It was the first time that JAXA had offered an opportunity of this kind. Students from Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand came with their respective Kibo ABC representatives to the Kibo control room and watched their experiments being carried out in real time. event so this one is called the flying paper plane uh, proposed by Singapore uh, student I really enjoyed this one uh, because uh, my background was a commercial airline pilot and uh, what I am doing is changing the angle of uh, control surfaces of the airplane and see how it affects the aerodynamics of uh, the airplane And those students were invited to the space, Tsukuba Space Center, and they were actually monitoring while I was performing their experiment. And this one is from uh, Indonesia. It's called Box in Jar. And I used a Ziploc bag to contain uh, the water and also three bowls made from uh, light wood and also plastic and aluminum. And see how uh, those three different uh, material balls behaves in the liquid. When I move the Ziploc bag. This one was very difficult to do in space, but uh, that was called uh, capillary in uh, zero gravity, which was proposed by a student from Thailand. So this uh, red liquid is a uh, colored water, and also I used uh, silicon oil and to compare uh, those two types of uh, liquid, how they behave in uh, microgravity in terms of uh, uh, viscosity, capillary, and also surface tension. Experiment. I have uh, to get the benefit from the Kibo program. Thank you. These students received enthusiastic support and media coverage in their home countries. It was a life changing experience. The event raised the profile of the Kibo ABC groups around Asia. I really enjoyed this kind of uh, program or event because uh, education is one of the most important factors of the international space program, space station program. And we can never uh, evaluate or estimate its value in numbers. However, it's really important to encourage those young children uh, who will uh, support our nations and uh, our world in the next generation because uh, and, uh, by doing this kind of educational event we can motivate those kids to study about space and also become interested in uh, science and hopefully those kids uh, can raise our level of uh, knowledge in the future. So uh, next I think Katie is going to talk about the uh, science aspect of the International Space Station program.
Thanks, Doc. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the new developments on the space station in terms of our scientific capability. Uh, we've added a lot of modules to the space station, and um, most of the way that we've done research in space uh, for the last several decades has been these really large rack-sized uh, parts of the module. And so you go in and you put something into the rack and you generate a result. Uh, one of the things that we are working on in Space Station is to actually miniaturize and modularize a lot of the science experiments so that you can fly these very small pieces of equipment uh, and get some amazing molecular biology results. Uh, ISS is, is an incredible research lab. We all know that. Uh, some of the goals of the program are to really understand the fundamental differences in microgravity. And one of the ways that we take, a, we, uh, take advantage of that is by understanding the unique properties of fluids in biological experiments. We're trying to determine how DNA and RNA in your cells, uh, your tissues, animal models, and, and the human body actually changes in microgravity. And we'd also like to develop technology that can determine real-time results of the experiments. So we want to perform these experiments on board and actually just be able to beam the data back to the ground without having to send samples back to Earth. So our facilities are incredible. We've spent a long time building this research lab, and you can see here uh, one of the Melfi freezers uh, in Kibo retrieving a sample from this freezer that can be stored, uh, the sample can be stored up to minus 90 degrees. And so we can save these samples and we can return them to the ground. And this gives us a really unique window where we have the opportunity to both look at samples analyzed on orbit and compare that data to the same sample that's sent back to the ground. And that allows us to try to understand how we might do future research as we get farther and farther from Earth and we no longer have the ability to send samples back anymore. You can see Jeff is uh, centrifuging some blood here. So the majority of our program has really been based around uh, blood and urine collection uh, and some saliva collection. But we, we collect all these samples and then we're limited by the amount of cold stowage that we can send to the ground. So think about the kinds of, of tissues and samples we could collect if we started processing them on board the space station. We could analyze them in real time and send only the data back, which we're much less limited uh, on the amount of data that we can send back versus the amount of cold stowage. Uh, one of the first places that you really think about this being of advantage is for microbial sampling. So the space station is a completely unique microbial environment. It's its own microbial niche, and it's been evolving separately from the Earth for 16 years now. And so you can imagine there's a lot of interest in understanding the microbiome of the spacecraft environment. We want to understand what lives on the surface, uh, what, what lives on the humans that inhabit the spacecraft, and how that might be changing as we get a new group of humans up there, as we get cargo up there, uh, or as we go through the course of our mission. And so you could take a thousand samples on a spacecraft and actually do some complex analysis, I'll talk about this afternoon, uh, looking at DNA sequencing to understand the entire population of microbial communities in this spacecraft. We also have a place that we can do life science experiments, the microgravity science glove box, that we very recently have outfitted uh, with the tools and technology that allows us to do things like rodent dissection and cell culture uh, and all of the kinds of molecular and cellular biology that you would find in an Earth-based lab. We can now do on board ISS in this science glove box. We talked a little bit about the cell culture, the cardiomyocyte culture. And this is pretty incredible that we can actually grow cells for 30 days continuously. Uh, so we've grown cells for shorter times on board, uh, but this actually allows us to look at long-term effects on cellular processes. And we can expand this cell culture uh, to potentially look at many generations of cells and how microgravity affects these cells uh, as they're propagating on board the space station, uh, how might changes in, in the radiation uh, environment induce changes in the cells, and how their behavior differs as they're growing and dividing continuously in microgravity. We also have the uh, option to do rodent research, and this is, uh, uh, this is a NASA uh, facility uh, we also have JAXA abilities to do this kind of research. 
So we can, we can actually study mammalian systems in microgravity, and this is a capability for space station that allows us to, to study rodents for 30 days, 60 days, maybe 90 days, which is these incredibly long periods of time, to look at things like immune dysfunction, neurovestibular, vision changes, and genomic effects. We also installed, while we were up there during Expedition 48, a plate reader, and so this uh, I couldn't quite get Jeff and talk as excited about this piece of equipment that I, as I was uh, being a scientist. But it is it's an incredible piece of equipment. It actually allows you to take a plate, uh, and it can read through spectroscopy. It can read every, cell, every well of that plate simultaneously. And so you can look at up to 384 samples uh, at the same time. It's really a facility. You can use it for fluorescence intensity. You can use it for UV vis. Uh, or time resolve fluorescence, and actually look at, at processes in really high throughput. So instead of processing one sample, or two samples, or 10, and sending them down to the ground, we can process 384 at the same time. Uh, it takes an hour or two, and then you can imagine ways that you could look at thousands of samples on board space station. Uh, we also uh, uh, brought up and developed a new capability called Wet Lab 2 which increases our ability to uh, do bioprocessing on board. So oftentimes we have things like a skin sample from a human or a tissue from a rodent. Normally we would freeze that and send it back down to the ground. This facility actually allows you to extract RNA or DNA on board, and then we can analyze it with a PCR reaction. So, so PCR is something that allows us to, to determine how many copies of a given gene are in a sample. This is really important to tell if that gene is turned off or turned on by spaceflight. Uh, you can look at things like, uh, is the DNA in your sample mutating? Uh, is the epigenome affected at all? So we were able to process these on board the space station, and then this is an example uh, of the modular type of, of equipment that we had up there, that's a PCR machine. It's just an off-the-shelf commercial PCR machine that we certified and flew onto space station, plugs into the wall, and gets put away when you're done. So these are the very first experiments. These, is ju these are just published um, from some experiments that Jeff and I did. And you can actually see the, uh, the curves, the microgravity and the ground control curves. And the ground control curves look very good. Uh, the microgravity curves look good at the beginning and then start to diverge. And this is one of the interesting uh, examples of how space and ground coordination can try to figure out what's going on in these samples. So it turns out that the, uh, in microgravity, we get bubbles forming in the tubes. And these bubbles are actually leading to degradation in the fluorescent signal, or not, uh, not, not quite the beautiful exponential curve of fluorescent signal that we're used to seeing. And so this was a way that, that we did, Jeff started these experiments, uh, I, I continued them, and, and ground noticed these bubbles and noticed uh, the differences in the curves. And in real time, we did some troubleshooting. We said, let's think about a way to reduce those bubbles. And so we actually changed the cap on the tube. And you can see that when we went to a cap uh, that allows you to push down and keep, uh, essentially force all the air out of the sample, we could then regain good curves. And this was just in the course of one ISS increment that we observed this problem, did some troubleshooting, changed out the caps, and were actually able to determine better data. So the scientists are getting their data in real time, and we can look at the experiment, and we can change the experiment on board. This is a, a very different paradigm uh, from the, the days where we used to fly a payload. The PI had one chance to do the payload, and if it didn't work, uh, you'd have to wait quite a few years for your next shuttle mission. So we can actually work directly with the PIs. I talked to them on space to ground. We did some troubleshooting, and together we came up with a way to make this experiment work. Uh, so this is, the, this is the page that actually talks about all of the open opportunities, the new research opportunities uh, that we're soliciting for on Space Station. And so it's a great way, if you're interested, to see uh, what are the areas that people are thinking about, what places do they want to do research, uh, what things are we proposing to? Uh, this, will, this will list all of the, the current active uh, NASA and CASIS funding opportunities. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed our, our Expedition 4849 update, the latest from Space Station.
Kate. Honored in the name of the Kness and Cadmos to present our activities before this audience. Although I see that after Kate and uh, Takuya, it's going to be rather tricky to capture your attention, but I will nevertheless. Try. So Cadmus is not just a Greek hero who founded Thebes City. It's also a control center based in Toulouse, quite close to here, and which uh, can, does the operational control for manned flights. About three kilometers from here, our activities, as Sergi was saying, are similar to those undertaken by the Marshall Space Center in the States, a sort of payload operations and integration center in Toulouse. So we uh, carry out experiments on payload development, and we prepare operations, and we carry out operations, not just for the payloads that we develop, but also for those that are entrusted to us by the ESA in the case of ESOC or uh, by direct cooperation that we have with American partners, Japanese, Canadian, Russian partners, and uh, recently with Indian partners also. So a question that uh, comes back constantly when we present the different experiments that we run and that we work upon with our astronauts uh, in very varied areas, such as life sciences and everything you can see on the screen, the question that keeps coming back is, what's the point in setting up so many experiments of making your life complicated on board the ISS? The answer that we give to this question, there are two main answers. The first are sciences, the sciences that Kate was talking about earlier on. So all of these sciences with a big capital S that uh, benefit from the very particular uh, environment of zero gravity to carry out the research. Therefore, the experiments that we uh, run up there have the vocation of discovering new applications and new theories, which uh, are then brought back to Earth to improve uh, knowledge of mankind. The second main activity is linked to space exploration. The experiments that we run up there use land technologies with the purpose of allowing them to progress so that are developing them so that they're able to rise and meet the challenges of space exploration. So, of course, once the progress uh, has been achieved, uh, they have the vocation of coming back to Earth and then impacting Earth technology to facilitate facilitate life and the comfort of all of our uh, pair, peers on Earth. So uh, with these two objectives in mind, necessarily the Proxima mission with a French astronaut gave it the opportunity for Cadmus to carry out new experiments. Uh, the six experiments that we developed were selected with a very clear idea in mind, and that was to prepare for the future of space exploration. So they were all developed within the framework of the ISS, but their vocation was to go much further and uh, to find applications beyond ISS. So I'm now going to give you a quick glimpse of the six experiments that we carried out in CADMOS in collaboration necessarily with the uh, ESA, but also the NASA, the CSA, and with the uh, very first person concerned by this mission, Thomas Pesquet. The first of these exper experiments was an aquapad. The aquapad is a very small device, uh, as you can see on the screen. Its uh, purpose is to test uh, whether the astronaut's uh, water is drinkable. It's a very important question. And the idea is to use innovative technology that uses a system of dry detection, which uh, greatly simplifies the process. So the aquapad, the goal was to be as simple and as uh, strong as long as possible, so you just uh, take a sample of water in a syringe, you inject it, and that's it. Then you can forget about this little piece of uh, plastic and put it away in a corner of the ISS, as you can see on the photo. Two days later, we use an application that allows us to count the number of colonies of bacteria to know whether the water is uh, drinkable. So the system is so simple and effective that we're currently just talking with the NASA to actually make it operational so it can be 
consistently Madame used on ISS. Uh, and with Bera Meria, who is our partner for this application, um, we are currently trying to develop new applications in the field of microbial detection, in particular the, the PCR that we were talking about earlier on. The second experiment is called Matisse. It is the fruit of a collaboration between the CNES, the Lyon uh, School, uh, High School, and uh, the Saint-Gobain, which uh, works in habitats in France. And it is also a rather simple experiment. It's a, a small device such as this, and the objective is uh, with its uh, Velcro to be uh, uh, stuck to the wall of the station. And in these little cells that you can you can see here there's an adaptation of an innovative uh, uh, material that is high, uh, hyper uh, phobic and the idea is to count all of the microbial populations that cover the walls of the station to avoid their proliferation so the uh, ultimate objective is also to limit the activity which is uh, 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 which, which the astronauts hate doing, and that is to house clean. So uh, this experiment, uh, we can also imagine applications on Earth, because this type of surface that resists contamination can be used in public transport, for example, to avoid uh, contact contamination. So, there is a medical diagnostics material that requires a great deal of know-how skills and experience. That is uh, ultrasounds. I imagine that among the astronauts here today, uh, there are a number of you who found themselves uh, doing and redoing ultrasounds because the scientists or the physicians on Earth uh, decided they were not they were not entirely satisfactory, uh, not satisfactory enough to pursue the experiment. So, what we developed in Cadmos was a system that brought a cru crucial progress in this. Uh, in this uh, field, and it is uh, teleoperations for ultrasounds. So, in collaboration with Sono Scanner, Vermin, uh, and with a big professor of uh, ultrasounds, Philippe Darve, in France, uh, we tried to develop a probe um, whose specificity is to ha have a miniaturization of the uh, motors that allow us to articulate the probe, but above all, to operate it remotely. That means that we very quickly. Uh, you can reproduce the movement of the specialist. What you can see on the picture within the yellow circle on Earth is Professor Philippe Arbe, who is using his uh, probe with all with the skills of uh, a physician. And the same yellow circle that you can see on board next to Thomas uh, is reproducing the movements uh, done by the professor. And this allows a very precise diagnostics to be made of the patient on board the ISS. So thanks to Thomas, we managed to show that this concept is quite functional, that it works very well on board the ISS, despite, despite the distance, despite the speed. And thanks to this demonstration, the um, uh, ultrasound machine will now be used for ultrasound experiments uh, on board ISS, of course. And uh, we are also uh, going to try and make sure that this is used for the uh, medical follow-up of astronauts on board. Of course, uh, equipment such as this has immediate applications within the field of remote medicine, which are uh, currently much sought after. Uh, outlooks, uh, uh, perspectives is a model of virtual rea reality, a platform that was developed with virtual IT and uh, Oculus. Our objective here was to develop and adapt and set up a platform of virtual reality that works perfectly at zero gravity. So once again with Thomas, we were able to demonstrate that this adaptive platform works perfectly well at zero gravity and yields all of the expected results. 
It will be used in the coming months to carry out neuroscientific experimentations and uh, within the outlooks of uh, space uh, exploration, uh, virtual reality and perspectives will be used, we hope, for operational activities, applications, or for astronauts' leisure activities. I imagine that the promise conveyed by this picture does, among the astronauts in the audience, uh, generate a great deal of interest, but also a few smiles, because uh, everywhere is the personal assistant whose purpose is to, is to relieve the astronaut of the fastidious tasks that they have to uh, do every day, to give them a bit, of free a bit more free time. So everywhere today is a sort of a, a series of applications that allow them to manage the nutritional follow-up of the astronauts, the medical follow-up also, uh, by using uh, physiological sensors uh, wi wi with wireless technology and also support for the, uh, the unrolling of experiments. So the uh, connection of this iPad and the application directly uh, to Earth uh, subsequently allows uh, the Earth to have visibility over the data with the necessary confidentia confidentiality without the astronaut having to uh, do all of the transfers because the transfers are automatic. Within the perspective of space exploration, once again, the objective is to add uh, expert system functions to everywhere so that it provides an even more interesting service for astronauts. So, on the right-hand image at the top, you can see two uh, aspects which are particularly important in the life of Toulouse. First of all, there's rugby with the jersey of the Stade Toulousain worn by uh, Thomas and gastronomy, fine foods. So it's quite probable that rugby does not have a very significant future in the ex space exploration, but what is sure is that nutrition does have a very important role to play. And in terms of nutrition and food, you know, no doubt that in France this is a very serious topic. So space nutrition is the fruit of a very long collaboration between the CNES, the chef Alain Ducat, and the uh, uh, and ENAF uh, that makes um, uh, tin food. And so uh, there are special event meals that are made available by the CNES and the CNES. And our objective is to go even further in this area. And that is to uh, offer a nutrition and meals for the astronauts, which of course uh, keep them healthy. That's the main purpose. Of nutrition, but also provides them with a certain pleasure because that's very important for morale to have meals that are that are pleasant to eat, and to also to be able to position ourselves within the recycling loop, uh, within the for the outlook of space exploration, of course. Fluidex was the last experience that, the experiment that we developed in Cadmos. This is a machine that uses uh, balls such as this with colored water. It's not whiskey. It's not pastis. And to make it vibrate, move, and see the reaction of fluids within the uh, ball. Thanks to this uh, small ball that we developed with uh, Airbus Defense and Space in Toulouse and the Ecole Normale in Paris, we developed two types of experiments. The first uh, was for pure sciences on wave disruption, and uh, the other was a far more technical aerospatial dimension, and that is the sloshing uh, within the satellites of reservoirs or for the uh, launchers. So the six experiments that we looked at briefly allowed us to highlight the know-how of CADMOS in the field of payload developments and development of experiments, and it also allowed us to highlight our experience in terms of operations because we CADMOS has been carrying out experiments for the past 25 years and operations in the field of manned flights. We have already integrated many, a, a great deal of progress in the control centers that allow us to uh, provide all of the services required for ISS, and uh, this will no doubt continue in the future so that we can support space exploration. So today, CADMOS is, has a, a team of about 40 people, a few of them are here today.
Donc quelques-uns sont là aujourd'hui. So, so, so mettent en œuvre toutes les spécialités implement all of the specialties necessary for a um, control center for manned flights. Because beyond all of the experiments and systems, as ingenious as they might be, such as the ones we just presented to you, what remains important is that manned flights are first and foremost a question of men and women. For the future of space exploration, on our side, we're convinced that there will be two key words that will be mandatory for all, that is collaboration and cooperation. We have already talked at length, and we are convinced that this cooperation is all begins within control centers such as ours. Cooperation between the different specialities and the people who work there and who have succeeded in implementing all of the experiments that we've just seen. There's also cooperation between Earth and uh, the spacecraft, between us, the operators, and you, the astronauts, because we form an uh, indissociable community. The success that we have, or that you have, are closely related to the devotion of all of the others. So we, need, uh, must take, we would like to take advantage to thank here Thomas and all of the other astronauts of the increments 51-52 that uh, gave rise to this tremendous success of the Proxima mission. La cooperation elle cooperation être must also be international. We've also talked about this at length because the work sites of space exploration require challenges that uh, will require the collaboration of all. For the past 25 years, as I was saying in Cadmos, we have been working and sharing our passion for manned flights with uh, space agencies, uh, scientists, and industrialists uh, throughout the world. So collaboration is something that is very important to us. Collaboration is also something that uh, is within a more global and broader context that the Knesset decided to promote. And this is Fo FOXI, as you see up there. It's the Operation Center for Science and Exploration. So this is a very large ambition carried by the Kness and which brings together man flights with expo uh, exploration by robots and uh, scientific systems that are on board the satellites, uh, and this, these create a, a, a coherent whole. I would like to conclude by saying that the dream that you carry, ladies and gentlemen, the astronauts, that you carry in the name of the whole of mankind, and in our name also, is that that is conveyed by the little prince of saint Exupéry that we spoke about yesterday. The name Foxy was chosen in reference to the fox uh, in the story of the, of the little prince. To close with a paraphrase uh, by, of the astronauts, which is the least we can do, we can no doubt see the Proxima mission as a small step in the great history of Proxima, but it's this small step which will allow us to, uh, to achieve with all of you many giant leaps towards space exploration. Apollo 17 did this just before me, so I will also take advantage of this by uh, quoting a French philosopher, Bernard de Chartres, and he says, we are just merely dwarfs uh, perched on the shoulders of a giant. A look at uh, what's happening beyond low Earth orbit. So uh, we invited another speaker from CNES, uh, Muriel de, de Luz, uh, and uh, she will talk about the Curiosity rover and the Mars 2020. So uh, yeah, Mars, please. Donc bonjour à toutes et à tous. So, good morning, Donc, everybody. Deleuze, I am Muriel Deleuze. I'm in charge de in the CNES of the French contribution Mars to the Mars 2020 mission. Je suis très de I'm very honored today to speak before you, and I will have the difficult task of presenting two Mars missions, Curiosity Mar uh, Mars and Mars 2020, after the excellent uh, mission uh, carried out on, on Mars. So this uh, shows you the two Mars missions, Curiosity and Mars 2020, in the context of 
the exploration of Mars, because water is a key element for the emergence of life. The first missions on Mars took an interest in the presence of water in the ancient history of Mars. Once we've done this step, Curiosity marked a transition in the Mars missions by taking looking at the question of the inhabitability of the planet. And then a, a mission, a preparation mission such as Mars 2020 or ExoMars will go take another step and look at uh, and will try to look for signs of life. So now, curiosity, you may have heard of the Martians Laboratory, and in fact, MSL is the initial name of the mission, whereas curiosity is the name of the rover. But when landing on a selected site, the presence of water in the past, the main purpose of a curiosity mission is to determine whether conditions for life that, that were favorable to life might have existed one day on Mars. So now we're going to look at the scientific payload in Curiosity. So you might have seen the, the uh, mock-up outside. It's a big rover with the size of a small car. And it's 900 kilos. And it allows a payload of 10 instruments and a borer to bore down into the Martian rock. So uh, uh, when I talked about uh, the instruments on them, the KenCam, which is equipped with a, a strong a powerful laser that can shoot at the rock, vaporize a fine surface area that is analyzed by a spectrometer that is within the rover. And this allows us to find the uh, atomic composition of the uh, material. We also have a mass cam camera and a high resolution color camera. Uh, then now we're going to look at the uh, articulated arm. On this arm, we have two contact instruments that can take uh, close-up shots of the rocks and the soil, and that can also take pictures of the rover itself. And it's thanks to Maddie that, Maddie that we uh, saw the selfies of Curiosity. We have APXS, which is a spectrometer to determine the uh, small elements of raised school, small scale because it's in contact with the soil. Now we're going to look at the inside of the rover. In the body of the rover, we have a mini lab that analyzes the samples that were collected and brought back by the arm. So we have an instrument called SAM, which is a series of three instruments that allow us to detect a large range of organic com compounds. The gaseous phase chromatography of SAM is the French contribution to SAM. In the body of the rover, once again, we have a chemin that carries out the mineralogical uh, analysis of the rock samples. And to finish, we have uh, four instruments that look at the characterization of the Mars environment. We have MARDI uh, under the, beneath the rover, which is a descent imaging. Uh, instrument, France, which is a, a weather station, a, a RAD, which measures radiation, and DAN, that measures hydrogen. So, I'm now going to describe the different phases of the mission before we land on Mars. First of all, the preparation of the mission. This is a very important phase, which includes the development, the assembly, and the testing of the uh, Curiosity rover, uh, of which you've already seen some pictures, but also of the satellite. The satellite that allows the rover to travel between Earth and Mars and to land on Mars. This phase for Curiosity lasted six years because the mission was uh, decided in 2005 and the launch took place in 2011. So on the bottom left, you have a picture of the launch, which happened on the 26th of November 2011 from the launch base in Florida. Uh, in Cap Canaveral. And to uh, close, we have cruise configuration. So between the launch and the landing, that phase lasts about eight months. So we reached Mars in August 2012. At that point, there's a phase that we call EDL, Entry, Descent and Landing which consists in uh, going through the uh, layers of the atmosphere of Mars and landing on Mars. Donc, le 
Donc pour MSL, compte so for de la masse MSL, considering the, high, the big mass of weight of rover, uh, we had to develop a specific uh, technique. So the satellite Ensuite, descends le, beneath le a parachute, then the thermal shield that you can see here is separates off, detaches, and in the last seconds of the landing phase, this part that we call the sky crane, en fait. Donc les fusées Uh, the uh, rockets of the sky crane uh, light up in order to maintain everything within a stationary position. And then the rover is detached and deposited on the land and held by cables. Once the rover is on the ground, the cables are cut and the sky crane set rises up and crashes a little bit further on at a safe distance from the rover. So here you have an image of the sky crane depositing the rover. On the bottom left, you have an overall view of the landing site, the uh, Gale Crater, which is about 150 kilometers in diameter, with, uh, on, in the bottom in yellow, the dispersion ellipse of the landing zone. And on the bottom right hand, at uh, the touchdown point of Bradbury, you have the a, uh, view taken from the satellite of the different uh, parts of the uh, EDL uh, system around the Curiosity rover. Donc maintenant que nous avons atterri, so, now that we've landed, we need to carry out the first operations. At the top left, you have an image taken by a touchdown point, uh, of the touchdown point. And you can see on the picture the uh, traces left by the sky crane. Uh, on the top left, you have the first picture taken by the NAVCAM camera, uh, which is a, a navigation camera, part of the payload. So you can see at the bottom the shadow of the rover, and uh, it had not yet been deployed. Below you have a mosaic, for a mosaic from the Mascan camera that we talked about, um, and, uh, which is on the arm. You have a mount sharp in the background, as in the top picture, and there you have the shadow of the rover and also the shadow of the mast. So in the series of the first operations to be carried out in the first pictures taken, Donc vous avez deux you have de two pictures of the arm after là, vous avez une image deployment, and here you have a picture of the turret taken from the arm by Mali. the uh, camera, Mali camera. Après les, donc les, les opérations liées Then au the operations related to the mast and the arm, we have to do the first Rocknest, drilling on a rock called Rock Nest on the site of donc, Yellowknife bas, Bay. So at the bottom you have a picture of this first borehole on the site, droite, donc, and on the right you have a selfie of curiosity taken by the cameras sur le bras. on the arm. Cette image montre en fait this le, uh, picture shows par, the route uh, taken by Curiosity from its uh, touchdown site in Bradbury on uh, the 7th of August 2012 until the point where it was last month in September 2017. So the dotted line that continues up to the geological level that contains clay and sulfates that were detected from the orbit, these constitute the final destination for rover. So what we see in this area, it's in this part of the crater. So now we're going to have a little slideshow of the pictures taken by the rover as it travelled along this route. At the top left you have, we can see the marks left by the rover's wheels on the Martian sand. And at the top right you have a close-up with the same camera that is on the arm. Uh, of the Comme wheels, savez, as you know, these wheels, which are made of metal, uh, 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 are damaged en by the rocks. The rocks. At the bottom, image, uh, you have, have a, a, a wide shot taken with the uh, uh, camera on the arm of the, arm of the lower uh, layers of the mount shard. So here are the dunes, and in the middle you have the layers of clay and sulfate, which are the final destination of rover.
Donc toujours cette, sur so, cette route, hein, à destination route, de ces couches, uh, donc, cette layers, image montre la dune de Namib. Euh, en fait, elle n'est pas très, très Actually, élevée. Elle est très haute. Elle était estimée à être environ 4 mètres haute. Cette dune est partie de la bande de Bagnol, qui est une bande de dunes de black sand sur la côte ouest. Of the Mount Chard. Sur cette route, hein, on this le, route, la région des dunes uh, still, de Bagnol, after the region of donc, dunes, euh, la région des buttes de, de Murray, a été traversée. Donc, en, sur, la, sur la vue que vous and avez en haut à gauche, that you have the top entre left, les deux buttes, the two, entre les deux plateaux, uh, plateaux on a une distance we, there is a distance of about 80 meters. Donc, on est quand même là meters. sur des formations so de, de grande échelle. Formations. Pour changer un petit peu, donc, uh, to, là vous avez sur, sur l'image de gauche Here on the top une, left you donc, une roche qui a à peu près la taille d'une balle de golf. Et en fait, il s'avère que c'est une météorite de fer et de nickel. Donc la composition de cette météorite a été confirmée thanks to Chemcam à l'image à droite par les images de Chemcam à l'image à droite en réalisant des tirs au laser qu'on appelle en rasse de gilles 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 de Shots on the meteorite. De vue plus récente, hein, Some more recent rover, view, uh, hein. pictures Donc, taken by the rover, Irison Hill, which is a hill that measures about five meters high. And below you have the Vera Rubin Ridge, which, in this picture taken by the ChemCam camera, we can see the layers of sediment and the effects of erosion caused by the wind on this ridge. Donc un peu dans la, dans la continuité de ce qui a so été présenté par, par Patrice. Donc à Toulouse, nous sommes très Toulouse, fiers de, de pouvoir réaliser des opérations de uh, contribution française uh, dans un instrument qui sont CAMCAM et SAM. Uh, and Donc Sam ces opérations instruments. sont partagées so avec nos collègues américains. Soit pour CAMCAM, Donc une semaine sur CAM -CAM, one week out of every two. Donc maintenant, un petit bilan de, de so, tous les outils après cinq années d'opération sur la surface de Mars. Donc, pour commencer avec quelques chiffres, Curiosity a parcouru 18 km, a réalisé 15 heures de vol, et a parcouru 15 heures de vol, et a réalisé 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 15 And uh, we have Sur also a few plus, uh, plus wonderful plus selfies. On a plus a more scientific level, Curiosity taught us more about the complex geological processes that modified the environment of the crater throughout its history. Uh, conditions that uh, 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 favorable to life within the crater have been highlighted. In the future, when we When we explore the layers of sulfite and uh, clay, we hope to find new sites with conditions that were favorable to life and to better understand the, uh, the changing climate on Mars. Donc maintenant, avant d'introduire Mars 2020, donc une Mars planche 2020, de, sur les futures missions uh, Mars. Donc, euh, on, mission, on, la prochaine mission est une mission NASA, qui s'appelle INSIGHT, qui va être lancée l'année prochaine, that will be avec une forte year, contribution française. With a very strong French contribution. Ensuite, en 2020, donc, Then on nous l'a dit, nous aurons la mission de la NASA, ainsi que la mission ExoMars mission de NASA, and the exo -Mars, uh, mission of toujours dans les années 2020, uh, donc il y aura également une mission indienne, Magalian 2, Uh, we will uh, also have an Indian mission, Magalayan 2, and a Chinese mission with a lander rover. In the long term, uh, there is the mission for the return of these samples, which is the end point, not the end point, but it's a very important stage in Mars missions. Donc la mission Mars 2020. En fait, cette mission franchit une étape importante. Marked an important stage Cette mission franchit une étape importante dans l'exploration de Mars, parce qu'elle ne s'intéressera pas seulement à la question de l'habitabilité de la planète, comme l'a fait Curiosity, mais elle cherchera des signatures si elles existent qui peuvent attester une vie passée sur Mars. Mars 2020 embarque un système complètement nouveau 
de collecte des échantillons après le cas. Une mission permet également de rassembler des informations une vue du rover Mars 2020 rover. Et pour terminer, And donc, to close, je tenais à vous dire I que les, les hommes ont une grande chance d'aller un jour sur Mars. Mankind has a lot of chances of going to Mars, but sending astronauts to Mars and bringing them back safe and sound to Earth is a technical challenge. And so it's thanks to new technologies developed for the return journey to Mars and a survival for Mars that we will achieve this. So I'll conclude by saying that we must not forget our dreams and we must prepare for the human exploration of Mars in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, the last speaker of the session one, and the part one, is from uh, Vienna, uh, from the UN. What's uh, the United Nations? I believe you are here. Could you stand up, Doreen? Oh, hey, Doreen. Thank you. So he was a former chairman of committee on peaceful uses of outer space. So he's going to tell you about a lot about UN, UN USA later. So let me begin. This is the outline of presentation for today. So again, I'm going to talk about UN USA's structure, first of all, and then going into specific program called Human Space Technology Initiatives, about its history and its future plan. So here we go. This is a vision of our office. We are trying to fill in the gap in between spacefaring nations and non-spacefaring nations. There are varieties of space activities. However, we still have got the gap. So it is our, our mandate to fill in the gap by using space equally. So that the international cooperation is necessary. So here's the unique roles of UN USA. First of all, capacity building. As I already told you, we are trying to fill in the gaps in between space Faring, sp space faring nations and non space faring nations by collaborating by collaborations of space faring nations and and then the global facilitators i already mentioned about corpus which is committee on the peaceful uses of outer space and also we are facilitating legal space subcommittee and scientific and technical subcommittee as well. And then the third one, gateway to space. So UN USA is not only the entity who's doing the space, but it's the main body of the UN to coordinate about the space affairs thing. So we are trying to collaborate with other entities from the UN. So this is the structure of the UN, UN USA. So we have the director on the top, do you know Shimonetta Di Pippo? Uh, she is the director. And I'll show you the picture later on. Once you meet, it's really hard to forget about her. She is a very energetic lady, like the mother of UN USA. So under that, we have two sections, which is committee, policy, and legal affairs section. This section is running the corpus, LTS, and SDSC, those committees. But today, I'm going to focus on the, the other one, space application section, which I belong to. This section is doing a lot of activities, such as global navigation satellites, climate change, disaster management, and global health, lots of activities. And especially for today, I'm, I'm going to talk about human space technology initiatives. So this initiative has been launched by Mr. Takao Doi. He's also an astronaut from Japan in 2010. So this is not really old initiative, quite new initiative. So again, we have three object, object, objectives for that. The international cooperation. Without it, we couldn't achieve anything. And I'm going to introduce about the specific programs by collaborating with many countries afterward. Second of all, outreach. 
We are trying to distribute our opportunities or programs through the member states of the United Nations. Third, capacity building. So through those kind of programs, we are trying to build up the capacity in non-spacefaring nations. So this illustration shows you the history and how we start, how we develop the initiatives, human space technology initiative. First of all, we started with a very ground-based instrument called Klinostat. Probably you may heard it before. Um, we have concluded the program last year. This is a small kit and then which makes a rotation. And by rotating this, it creates a gravity with 360 degrees angle everywhere. And you can actually put in the seas inside of it and observe how it glows. And so far, we succeeded to distribute to 46 entities in 25 countries for this kit. And then here it comes with a cooperation with Germany. I'm going to talk about it later. It's a drop test. It's a drop tower. It's a really exciting program. And it's now still going on. And then after that, we launched finally the program, which actually leads us to the orbit, Kibo Cube, by collaborating with JAXA. And the other two are CMSA, China Space Station, SNC, Sierra Nevada Corporation. Those are our future plan. So this is actually leading to the orbit, access to space. So the title of this presentation, access to space. So this is a timetable and the history of HSDI. So I'm going to skip it for this time. So here we go, drop test. So this is the program, cooperation. So this is a program with the cooperation of the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, ZAM, and the German Aerospace Center, DLR. So the Bremen Drop Tower in Germany is a ground-based laboratory with a drop tube of a height of 146 meters, which is quite tall which can enable short microgravity experiments to be performed in various scientific fields. It is open to research teams from entities from all member states of the United Nations. So the team has to be conducted, consists up to four bachelors to PhD students who are endorsed by an academic supervisor. So once in a year, we open the opportunity to provide free drop test. And you can actually have an experiment for four times of dropping. So far, Jordan, Bolivia, and Costa Rica have been conducted to the experiment. And in this coming November, we selected the Warsaw University of Technology from Poland. Yep. And then here we go. This is for the office for the first orbital activity for the UN USA. So with the collaboration of Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, we finally could reach to the actual orbit. And early in the morning, actually TAC already gave you the instructions of uh, how to deploy the small CubeSat satellite from the ISS Kibo module. So you can actually have the image of deployment of the CubeSat. So for the first round, JAXA and UNUSA selected the University of Nairobi from Kenya. And now it's under development. And we are expecting to launch the satellite, the CubeSat, in end of this year or beginning of next year. And for the second round, we selected the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. Sorry about my Spanish. But it's from Guatemala, the university. So here's a brief ex explanation how to deploy. But basically, these are the three ob objects, which, can, which is called GEM, GEM Small Satellite Orbital Deployer, JSSOD. It is a mechanism for deploying small satellites designed in accordance with CubeSat design specification that transfers the satellites from the Japanese experimental module Kibos, AROC, to space environment and release them on orbit. 
It is composed of the satellite install cases, separation mechanism, and electrical box. Yeah, so I'm sure. So some of you actually touched and opened the airlock from the keyboard. So it goes out from the keyboard experimental module. Oh, and then it is the only platform on the ISS which can deploy the small satellite. And then JAXA have been, has been conducting to deploy the small CubeSat satellite so far. But with the collaboration of the UN, finally we made a one free deployment available every year for one entity, one new CubeSat for free. So here is the, are the pictures of developing for the Kenyan satellite. So actually, JAXA engineer visited the team in Kenya and um, confirmed the roadmap for the launch and also checking the situation or development of the satellite. And the bottom one is the actual satellite that they are de developing right now. Hopefully, it's going to be launched soon. And here we go. This is the latest picture from the second announcement of KiboCube, which were taken in Adelaide ISC 2017. So here you can see Miss Simonetta Di Pippo with fully smile and with Koichi Wakata. And he, he is the um, PI, project manager of the satellite from the Guatemala University. So this is a very important um, information and not notification. At the same time, we launched the announcement of opportunity for the third round of KiboCube. So please share this information to your friends or if you're teaching to your students to apply for this opportunity. This opportunity is open until 31st of March in 2018. So we are looking forward to receiving lots of applications. But um, one thing is it's only open for developing countries at the moment. So here is the future plan. With the cooperation of Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, we are planning to launch one vehicle, so-called uh, Dream Chaser in 2022. So inside of the vehicle, we are, ha we are thinking to have varieties of experiment based on your ideas. And recently, we have launched Call for Interest. And it is open for until November 1st. So if you are interested in, please visit our website and then subscribe for the Call for Interest. And this is a China space station, also our future plan. But the AO announcement opportunity is still under development, but you will hear about it this afternoon a lot, I'm sure. And the conclusion. So today, I would like to ask you for the collaboration with us. As some of may probably notice that we are missing kids program or very young age program. And I believe that astronauts or space scientists or space engineers have power to ignite the passion in children's heart. So it would be great to have cooperation with you guys and then launch the new kids program or something in the future. That's one of my desire to do. So thank you very much for listening. And I had such a great time share this moment here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayami. Uh, this time, I'd like to invite all the speakers uh, in the session once, uh, Maurice and uh, uh, morning session. The second session will start at 11.10. So uh, thank you very much for attention.
We are waiting for him to tell you uh, yeah. that uh, the press is waiting, they want to hear you.